Johnson. Personal, philosophical, and existential. There are many words to describe the ethically rich works of French auteur Eric Romare, whose profound effect and bold cinematic voice continues to have an impact on the medium some decades later. The series of films that catapulted Romare into artistic attention, the Six Moral Tales series, showcases Romare as a transcendental filmmaker who clearly stood out from his fellow French New Wave contemporaries. Each spotlighting encounters between fragile men and the women who tempt them. The films within the Six Moral Tales demonstrate Romare at his most morally charged and liberating, for these modernist and alluring works of cinema are both foundational and essential in his constantly evolving filmic style and undeniably influential career. Je vous gêne. Vous avez peur qu'on nous voit Oh non, de toute façon, je pars dans un mois. Ça vous gêne que je vous accompagne à bout de chemin Enfin. Écoutez, mettons-nous ici. J'ai un mot. In the first of his moral tales, The Bakery Girl of Monco, Eric Romer seeks to master a seemingly small and delicate exploration into the manipulation of love. Comparable to some of the more fleshed out films Romare would tackle later on in the series. With this film, Romare presents an exploration into the tactics employed by a young man on his pursuit of the women that surround him. If la santé prête à faire en ma faveur, exception à sa règle comme je l'eusse faite à la mienne. Mais il y avait un risque, et je ne voulais pour rien au monde gâter mes chances en me montrant tel que je n'étais pas. Here, Romare follows a man who, while searching for the women of his desire, begins to flirt with a bakery worker. Clearly more French New Wave inspired than his latter, more controlled and minimalist direction, it is clear that Romare's moral ideas were beginning to take shape in this small, delightful, but layered work. Il me semble que ça vient. Following on from the previous short work, Eric Romare's second film of the moral tales, Suzanne's Career, was the first feature film of the series, and was a lighter, more minimalist approach to the themes that the director would go on to perfect in his subsequent years. Following the story between two friends, Bertrand and Gilmi, things between them begin to be complicated when Gilmi starts to pursue a charming girl named Suzanne. Salut. Bonjour. Tiens, mets-toi là. Je peux prendre cette chaise, mademoiselle Mais oui. Ça va Here, Romare's moral messages stem from the idea of youth naivety and the bonds of friendship. And despite this being another smaller entry into the series, Romare incorporates a far grittier style here utilizing rough 16mm stock to emphasize this. And although in this work, Romare was yet to truly perfect his blend of philosophy and relationships, Suzanne's career is another worthwhile work that does demonstrate Romare's fascination in exploring the line between inaction and moral choices. The centerpiece of his six moral tales, Eric Romare's My Night at Maud's, showcases the very best elements of the director's distinctive style, and went on to bring forth his name to international attention. Although planned and referred to by Romare as the third moral tale, the production of My Night at Maud's was delayed due to the unavailability of Jean-Luc Trintignant, resulting in it being released after the fourth tale. Like all the films in the series, My Night at Maud's once again shines a spotlight on the philosophical ideas that surround Romare's morally conflicted characters. 
here we follow devout Catholic John Liu, whose morals and principles are challenged during a one-night stay with Maud, a divorced woman with ideals that oppose him. Playing with various philosophical ideals, Romare is once again sparking thought-provoking subtext through his characters, choices, and actions. The conflict between reason and faith is at the heart of this work. As Jean Lu spends more time with Maud, his desire grows, and he will eventually overcome his faith. Heavily based upon the philosophical principles of French mathematician Blaise Pascal, Jean Lu himself shares similar traits to that of Pascal. Jean Lu, like Pascal, is interested in history, mathematics, and sex, but yet Jean Lu states that he himself finds Pascal disappointing. Perhaps this infers that, although Jean Lu may respect his principles, he finds himself disappointing as a result. According to Pascal himself, one only has the right to love God. And this is the same issue that burdens Jean Lu's mind within Romer's film. By building his characters around these principles, Romer spends the entirety of the film's first half setting up the distinct moral choices of each character before playing these ideals against each other in the second half. Superbly photographed in black and white by frequent Romer collaborator Nestor Elmendros, Romer's precise focus on setting and season are once again demonstrated by the beauty of the snow-covered Clermont Ferrand. J'ai l'impression que tu as toujours été présente dans ma vie. Il y a des impressions trompeuses. Tant pis si je me trompe. In this sequence, towards the conclusion of Romer's film, we discover that Francois, the blonde girl from the church that Jean Lou has been seeing, has just admitted that the recent refusal of his affection and the distance between them is due to her guilt. Yeah regarding an affair she's been having with a married man. Oh, écoute, Françoise. J'ai 34 ans, tu en as 22, et nous nous conduisons comme des gamins de 15 ans. Tu n'as plus confiance en moi? This is something that Jean Lu doesn't seem to be concerned about. Perhaps this carelessness is due to the fact that Jean Lu himself has no reason to judge. Maybe this is even an element of relief for Jean Lu who was emerging from Maud's bedroom just prior to meeting Francois. Tu as... By watching the blocking Maintenant. and expressions of each actor in this scene, we can learn a lot from each of their moral beliefs. This is particularly notable in Jean Lu, who seems to have evolved his rigid ethical standards fitting as a truly exquisite example of the moral progression within my night at Maud's. At its core, Eric Romare's My Night at Maud's is about love and faith. In his usual philosophical and thoughtful approach, Romare has presented a true-to-life portrayal of human nature in its most honest form. Here he showcases the everlasting battle between one's carnal desire, the burden of the intellectual mind, and the moral principles that define our individuality. La Collectionus, the fourth moral tale from Eric Romare, was also the first of which to be in colour. When a seductive art dealer and his painter friend travel to the serenity of their Riviera for a vacation, they are soon disrupted by a third guest, a non-conformist woman known for being a collector of men. With a script written by Romare, alongside his three main actors, the film itself works remarkably well as a gender conflict tale and one of pure sensual and tactile curiosity. In this scene from Romer's film, we see Haiti as she's laying reading a book. She's the teenager who has previously been intimate with Rudolph and has since gone on to bring home new men each night. 
This is the topic of the conversation. Je ne suis pas une collectionneuse. Ne dis pas ça, c'est ton seul mérite. C'est entièrement faux, je cherche. Je cherche pour essayer de trouver quelque chose. Je peux me tromper. Elle ne collectionne pas, elle prend ce qu'elle trouve. D'ailleurs, elle ne sait pas ce que c'est que l'éloignement. Non, j'exploite. In this sequence, the two friends can be observed antagonizing Haiti. We can see from the way that they debate with her that these men don't revere Haiti's life choices, nor are they willing to accept it, even though it may contradict their own moral beliefs regarding sex. Il faut toujours être quelque part en tuant quelque chose. Que j'ai couché avec toi ou non, c'est exactement la même chose. It is in scenes like these where we can truly observe Romare's layered, a nuanced approach to judgmental ethics in relation to both his characters and his audience. By presenting this tale in a light and graceful sense, Romare invites his audience to make their own moral judgments regarding the situations and characters at play within La Collectionus. This can be referred to as an intellectualizing of emotion, something that we have come to observe as a clear creative strength within Romare's work. Romare's direction is also accompanied here by Nesta Almandros's gorgeous photography, which helps to emphasize the natural splendor of the environments. This was a successful collaboration that would go on and continue to define the remainder of this series of moral-based films. In his fifth moral tale, Claire's Knee, director Eric Romare continues to prove himself as one of the most profound voices in French cinema. Here we follow Jerome, an engaged man who during a summer vacation is dared by a close female friend to flirt with the two beautiful teenage stepsisters she's living with, thus leading to Jerome's eventual desire to caress the knee of older sister Claire. <laughs> As previously seen, the films of Romare exist at levels far beyond their own plots. Romare's narratives merely exist as a means for his character's thoughts, desires and attitudes to take centre stage. This unique approach to the philosophy of humanity is perhaps why so many people have been drawn to Romare's remarkable works. Jean-Claude Briali is captivating in the film's leading role, a role that is filled with complexity. The character of Jerome requires Briali to engage with all three women in the film, and at all times he must remain faithful to his unseen fiance. Like in his concluding tale, Love in the Afternoon, Romare once again suppresses his sexual desires here, thus making all the character action on display more sensuous in the process. Another example of a remarkable work within this master's seemingly impeccable collection of moral tales, told through meticulous body language and exquisite compositions, Claire's knee is a wholly unique and nuanced look at male and female relationships. Love in the Afternoon, the final moral tale composed by French auteur Eric Romare, is a masterwork of love and infidelity-based cinema, all made during the height of the 60s sexual revolution, starring Bernard Valley as Frederick. Romare's film follows a happily married man who discovers that he can't stop looking away from the array of beautiful women that surround him every day. These appear to be harmless fantasies until one day at his office, the appearance 
by an audacious old flame, begins to mesmerize him instantly. Tender, somber, and wholesome from its very inception, many have called Love in the Afternoon Romare's most personal and emotional work. It has become apparent that the level in which Romare balances his flirtation and intellectual tension is that of a high standard. One could say that although his worlds would seem to exist in a French New Wave environment, the closest counterpart to Romare's character portrayals in these moral tales would be in the films of the Italian neorealist movement. Like the great masters of this era, Romare observes his character's conduct with those around him, and particularly how this reflects on one's own marriage and relationship. For the entirety of the film's first half, we are invited to a series of kinetic sequences delving into Frederick's mind. Et si votre mari nous voyait? Il n'est pas là. Allons chez moi. Je veux l'impossible, je le sais. Je n'envie personne. Et quand je vois des amoureux, je songe moins à moi, à ce que j'ai. It isn't until after this prologue where the true emotional power of romance film begins. Through cinematographer Nesta Almendros's soft lighting and chalky aesthetic, these images complement the film's seductive yet realistic nature. This can be classified as sexualized realism, so to speak. C'est fermé. In this sequence, we observe Frederick's final encounter with the alluring Chloe, the woman who has long been his temptress. Having just left his wife and children, Frederick arrives after being summoned by Chloe to her address. When he arrives, she is seen in the shower. Super. So far in the film, Frederick has resisted any essence of temptation. And now in the presence of Chloe in this setting, this playful situation has quickly turned adulterous. As she emerges from the shower, she invites him to towel her dry, which he does, before she then calls him to her bed. Bonjour. Bonjour. In this moment of both enticement and dread, Frederick decides to retreat, leaving Chloe naked in her bed. As the final chapter in Eric Romare's Moral Tales series, here we once again encounter many more subtleties within his masterful craftsmanship. For what makes Romare's work so inviting and smart is the way in which he observes his characters. And as evidenced in the penultimate sequence within this film, it can be supposed that perhaps the ultimate narrative purpose of Love in the Afternoon may be whether or not the lead character Frederick gives in to his desires. But perhaps the true and fundamental message here is what it means and what it requires of one to love one woman, yet to also be in love with all women. The six films that make up Eric Romare's moral tales help us to dive deep into existential, articulate thoughts of his fragile characters and the women who surround them. These films were responsible for putting Romare onto the global art house stage, 
presenting the world with a new philosophical voice, one that was equally liberating and thought-provoking. As evidenced, Romare presents romantic relationships as quintessentially human, fragile in their structure, while still thriving on impulse and motivation. Few filmmakers have the ability to invoke a sense of intellectualism quite like Romare. For these upper middle class characters, each share and stand by their own unique beliefs, allowing for a remarkable cinematic world that is built upon moral complexities and ethical judgments. A timeless self-reflection for those audiences willing to embrace this bold and intricate approach. The films of Romare showcase a perception of romance that varies by age, circumstance and identity. These are relationships that exhibit and incite remarkable intelligence, opening our minds to Romare's perception of life, relationships and the morals that define us.